Today on Vegan Freak Radio number 83, we interview Nathan J. Winograd, author of Redemption, The Myth of Pet Overpopulation and the No-Kill Revolution in America. Coming to you from high atop their elite fortress of moral superiority, here are your protein-deficient hosts, Bob and Jenna. Hey, freaks. This is Bob. And Jenna. And we're back again for another week of Vegan Freak Radio. This week, we have an interview with Nathan J. Winograd, as Jenna said. Very good interview, as I might say. (laughs) It was a very good interview. I think it was a very provocative interview because he raised some very big points that I think every vegan needs to hear and anyone who's interested in the animal rights movement needs to hear. Definitely. Because a lot of us have misconceptions about what goes on in shelters, what needs to go on in shelters. Absolutely. I think, I I, I mean, in my own experience, having talked to people about these issues, um, a lot of people, I think, view the euthanization of animals in in shelters as a regrettable but necessary fact of life. Right. You know, it's sad that we have to do this. There are millions and millions of animals... And they can't just suffer, or spend their whole lives in shelters, so we have to kill healthy animals, right? This is a, this is a, a line of, of logic that we hear all the time. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Not only from, you know, the, the mainstream organizations to support it, but from within the animal rights movement itself. There are a lot of people who back these ideas. What I think today's interview does very, very powerfully is to challenge that idea. Yep. To get you thinking that we don't need to do this. There are other ways to do this. There are indeed. And that's what I think is one of the most powerful things about what Nathan says in the upcoming interview. He talks about how institutional inertia has driven this kind of trend of killing animals for years and years. And he talks about ways in which we can reconceptualize shelters and reconceptualize our relationship um, with animals, with the public, with all, all kinds of different, um, I guess you'd call them stakeholders, mm-hmm. to really think about how we might save animals rather than killing them. Yes. It's just a change in focus, and it's a very powerful change in focus. Mm -hmm. And he's shown that he can do it in different parts of the United States, which I think is also very powerful, the examples that he talks about. Absolutely. So buckle up, hang on. This is a good interview. It's about a little under an hour long, but stay tuned. Enjoy it. It'll get you thinking. Make a note of what's bothering you. Call us with questions. Call us with ideas. We want to hear back from you on this. I know that this is going to, to, to be a provocative topic for a lot of you, but I think it's really powerful, and I want to encourage you to listen to it. So without further ado, here is the interview with Nathan. Nathan J. Winograd is the director of the National No-Kill Advocacy Center. He is a graduate of Stanford Law School, a former criminal prosecutor and corporate attorney, was director of operations for the San Francisco SPCA and executive director of the Tompkins County SPCA, two of the most successful shelters in the nation. He has spoken nationally and internationally on animal sheltering issues, has written animal protection legislation at the state and national level, has created successful no-kill programs in both urban and rural communities, and has consulted with a wide range of animal protection groups, including some of the largest and best known in the nation. His work has been featured in such widely read publications such as Reader's Digest and USA Today, industry publications like Animal People, Cat Fancy, and Best Friends, and newspapers from all over the country. His creation of the nation's first no-kill community was named one of the top 100 achievements in the United States by Metropolitan Home in its 2005 Best of the Best issue. As a nationally recognized speaker, Nathan has also spoken at national animal welfare conferences from coast to coast. He has spoken internationally as well as a guest of the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies and has been invited to speak as far away as Australia, Ireland, and the Czech Republic. He has also lectured on animal sheltering ethics to students at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine and at the UCLA School of Law on animal law issues. Nathan is joining us today to talk about his book, Redemption, The Myth of Pet Overpopulation and the No-Kill Revolution in America. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Thank you for having me. Well, we're really glad that you're uh, going to join us today because uh, I have to tell you, I read this book, Redemption, and I was actually, I I was awestruck by it in a lot of ways, and, and I couldn't believe some of the things you were talking about in this book. I couldn't believe that things were the way you described. I mean, I believe it's not that I don't believe what you've written, but I couldn't believe that you know there was all this kind of institutional inertia in place and things like that. So I wonder if you can maybe give us a quick overview of the book. 
Well, uh, first let me say that you're not alone in, in your surprise. You know, at one point I too was surprised. Um, I was a law student at Stanford University and uh, uh, I met a woman who was feeding some cats on campus and she uh, she told me that at one point the university had announced plans to round up and kill the feral or wild cats that lived on the Stanford University campus, about 1,500 of them. And a group of students, staff, and faculty sort of banded together and tried to come up with a life-saving alternative. And they turned to the local shelter, uh, the Humane Society of Santa Clara Valley, thinking that saving the lives of these cats would be within the humane mission of the Humane Society. Uh, but in fact, the Humane Society sided with the university and said that the cats should be trapped and killed because they weren't socialized to people and therefore not adoption candidates. And so the group turned to the nation's largest and wealthiest uh, animal protection organization, the Humane Society of the United States, thinking they'd, I, I guess, naively thinking they'd get a different answer. And in fact, HSUS also sided with the university saying the cats should be killed. For me, that was my lesson in the, the status of animal sheltering in the United States, and I sort of pledged at that point that I would dedicate my life to changing the status quo. Um, and I did go to work uh, for the San Francisco SPCA um, at a time when uh, it was committed to becoming the first city or leading the effort uh, to for San Francisco to become the first city in the United States to end the killing of, of healthy homeless dogs and cats. And when that achievement was reached, which everybody said was impossible, I would have thought that the nation's shelter directors and animal protection organizations, at least the ones that focus on companion animals, uh, would have cheered, but in fact, they denigrated it. Man. You know, in the book, you talk about shelters being stuck in this, and what you've called this adopt some, kill the rest thinking. And I'm wondering, why are they still stuck in this? What are the reasons that they give? I mean, I, I know that in the book, you talk about some of this, and um, maybe you talk about why some of those reasons are problematic. Well, uh, you know, I think the biggest reason is, is, and I think you, you sort of n nailed it in, in your first question, is, is what I call institutional inertia. I mean, we've been told in sheltering for well over a century uh, that there are just too many animals and not enough homes. And, and what shelters have done is, is what I call a failure of passivity, meaning that, you know, every day they open their doors in the morning, they close their doors at the end of the day, and then they just simply tally the number of animals that come in, tally the number of animals that go home, and when intakes outpace uh, adoptions, they, they sort of come to this conclusion that there's simply too many, and they execute the remainder. Uh, but what, what sort of is the central premise of the no-kill philosophy, uh, if I could summarize it in one word, it's being proactive. So rather than just wait for adopters to come to the shelter, uh, progressive shelters will take the animals to the adopters. So they'll take them to where they live and work and play, setting up adoption centers in local malls and shopping districts and retail areas in the, in the, in the residential neighborhoods, thereby increasing uh, the number of homes. Um, and I think that's the primary reason, uh, but I also offer five or six other theories in the book, um, uh, one of them being guilt, that uh, if, uh, if shelter directors were to acknowledge that there is an al another alternative uh, to the killing, then that killing becomes becomes unnecessary, um, and then they have to take responsibility for causing, you know, the barrels to fill every day with the bodies of furry animals. And uh, I think a lot of shelter directors aren't willing to look that way. But regardless of the reason, I think the end, at the end of the day, uh, no theory or no reason is acceptable, because if there are life-saving alternatives that shelter directors simply refuse to implement, then to me that's a great failure of caring. And in the book I talk about it. Uh, it would be like a doctor refusing to keep pace with the, you know, the state of medicine and treating pneumonia with leeches and bloodletting and, you know, and incantations as opposed to fluid therapy and antibiotics and, and rest. And uh, in sheltering, I think we have the same thing uh, because there are communities nationwide that have ended the killing of savable animals, and they've all done it using the same model, the model that was pioneered in San Francisco. And I would add that it's it's been successful in every community where it's been comprehensively implemented. So for me, at the end of the day, there's simply no excuse. What does that model look like? And, and maybe also you could touch on this idea that um, in the book you discuss how shelters were kind of, in a way, alienating and blaming the public. I mean, you talked about ours, but 
maybe you could talk about some of Th- those two things together, if they fit. Yeah, you know, it's uh, in San Francisco, it, there was no model. So it was sort of trial and error and trying new things and seeing if they worked. And sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. But it, And sometimes they needed to be modified. But it was always goal-oriented. Um, you, know, you know, what happens too often in this movement is, is shelters simply, you, you know, reach down into the same old bag of tricks and do things the way they've always done it simply because that's the way they've always done it. And And I argue in the book that that's sort of the uh, epitome in terms of the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And in San Francisco, what what sort of came out of the successful effort at the end of the day was a series of programs and services that I like to collectively call the no-kill equation. Uh, And they're really uh, community-oriented. You know, too often in this business when we're involved in animal protection, and it doesn't matter whether it's companion animals or farm animals, animals or uh, animals used in research or, 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 or for a quote-unquote entertainment or killed for sport, um, you know, we, we tend to adopt a very cynical and, and uh, almost uh, angry view of humanity. And, uh, you, you know, as a former prosecutor and as a former animal control director, yes, I've seen the ugly things that people can do, not just to the animals, but to each other. Uh, but that's only one part of humanity, and uh, at least as it relates to dogs and cats and, and uh, you know, I have no doubt we have uh, further to go when it comes to other species of animals, but as it relates to dogs and cats, as a general rule, not, I'm not denying your responsibility, but as a general rule, uh, the majority of us really love dogs and cats. And so uh, it's incumbent upon shelters to tap into that compassion for dogs and cats to help save lives. And some of those programs include allowing people to volunteer in the shelter, allowing people to foster animals. In other words, take these tiny kittens and puppies that aren't ready for adoption or injured animals or traumatized animals into their homes for short periods of time until the animals are old enough or well enough uh, to be adopted. Um, You know, programs to sterilize and re-release feral cats to volunteer caretakers who watch them and feed them and care for them uh, for the rest of their lives. But but since shelters have adopted the view that the public is irresponsible and the public is to blame for the killing, uh, a lot of them aren't able to make the mental leap that the public is also capable of great compassion. So rather than embrace the public, they set themselves up in an adversarial relationship. And I think that's really the great failing of traditional sheltering. There seems to be a lot of besides that myth that it's the public's fault, there seem to be a lot of myths at work here um, to prevent shelters from doing exactly what you just described. Um, and one of them is, you know, you described in your book about pet overpopulation being a myth. Another one that I hear a lot is, well, if we didn't kill animals in the shelters, then no one would have any incentive to go to one. Like They wouldn't feel the guilt in order to go to a shelter to, to get an animal. Could you uh, talk about some of these myths? Yeah, you know, that that last one, I can talk certainly about the myth of pet overpopulation, but that last one is 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 the argument, in fact, that the head of animal control in San Francisco made uh, in trying to oppose the effort to save the life of every, you know, create a guarantee for every healthy homeless dog and cat in San Francisco, saying that if, if, uh, if people thought that we were going to save their animals, uh, they, they would more likely surrender them or they would stop spaying and neutering. And really that argument uh, just is, is so incredibly bizarre, um, it, it's almost embarrassing that those kinds of arguments are being made publicly because if you think about it, logically what, what is being said is we need to keep killing so that people don't surrender their animals. And, and, how, and, and, and I, I don't know anybody who loves dogs and cats uh, that, that says that's a fair trade-off, sacri- needlessly sacrificing the lives of animals just to scare people uh, into keeping their animals. Because I feel like at the end of the day, one, that's not an ethical argument, but two, if someone doesn't want their animal and we have the ability to create no-kill shelters uh, and, and no-kill communities, then I would rather, as a shelter, director have them bring me the animal because I don't want that animal being in a home where, where he or she is unloved or uncared for uh, when, uh, when I can find that animal the type of home that he or she deserves. Uh, but, but really what, what keeps this keeps us mired in these failed policies and shelters is the myth of pet overpopulation. And again, that st- stems from shelter, shelter passivity because if you look at all the data 
there are about twice as many people looking to bring a, a new dog into their home every year than the total number of dogs entering shelters, and more people are looking to bring a new cat into their homes than the total number of cats entering shelters. Uh, uh, and so the, all the data points to the fact that, that we can be a no-kill nation today if every shelter in every community comprehensively implemented the programs of the no-kill equation. But more than just statistical data, we've seen what has happened in communities that have done so, communities like Tompkins County, communities like Charlottesville, Virginia, communities like San Francisco, communities like Reno, Nevada, communities like Ivan City, Utah, and others, and, and these communities sort of demographically share nothing in common. Some of them are urban, some of them are rural, some are in the north, some are in the south. Some are in areas that are considered blue states or very liberal, and at least one of them is in the reddest part of the reddest state. And that tells me, despite our differences on so many issues in the United States, when it comes to dogs and cats, people of all walks of life want to build a better world for them. That, that's such a powerful idea. And in, in reading about um, a lot of the tenets of kind of the no-kill philosophy, they're, they're really striking. But I think what is really surprising to me uh, is the extent to which certain groups, like groups that are ostensibly on paper in favor of protecting animal interests, like the Humane Society and uh, PETA, what what is really amazing to me is how these groups have either ignored the successes of places like Tompkins County and the, a bunch of other places you just cited, and how they've actually actively gone out against no kill in, in some situations. Can you maybe talk about some of that? Yeah, I, and... It- Particularly with the animal rights groups, it's been sort of personally very hurtful because, you know, I I have been an ethical vegan uh, since 1991, the first time I actually literally walked into a dairy farm thinking I was going to find an idyllic place and, and saw what I saw and literally at that point you know, quietly made a commitment to a particular cow, cow that, I, that I came across and said, I'm not going to participate in this. And so, you know, in terms of sympathies with the arguments, I think some of the arguments as it relates to other animals are unassailable ethically. And so, you, you know, why then are we not going to extend the types of uh, protections we seek for farmed animals, for example, to dogs and cats? Um, and, and I think part of it, at least it re- as it relates to a group like PETA, is that its founder actually, before she started PETA, uh, used to work at an animal control shelter in Washington, D.C., a shelter, I would add, that had, had and has a long history of, uh, of controversy surrounding its kill rates. To this day, it kills an inordinate, actually over 70% of all the dogs and cats that come through the shelter. And she did kill dogs and cats for that shelter when she worked there. And I think all the reasons that I talked about of why shelters uh, don't change uh, apply to PETA primarily because their founder and head um, brings those attitudes with her. I have no doubt that PETA will in finally embrace no-kill when its founder retires or resigns or is pushed out or leaves for whatever reason. Uh, but for now, groups like PETA and HSUS, primarily because their companion animal departments actually rose from the ranks of animal control. I mean, if you look at the vice president of companion animals at HSUS, which is the guy who oversees their policies as it relates to dogs and cats and shelters, his history is running shelters with a history of uh, high ki- high killing rates for dogs and cats. And, and it just is shocking for the average dog and cat person. And it's shocking for me because, as you know, in the different types of issues that you folks cover, uh, it's rare when the average American is more progressive than the national animal protection or animal <laughs> rights groups. But as it relates to dogs and cats and shelters, I think that is absolutely true. Absolutely. And actually, we, we have a voicemail from a listener. It's only 20 seconds long that it kind of hits on a similar question. Um, I'll play that for you, and maybe you can respond to that as well. Sure. Hey, Bob and Jenna. This is Joe for Big Guns and Roses from the forum. The question for the author is, how do we combat all the misinformation put out there by groups such as ACUSS, HSUS, or PETA when they get all the media attention and they have all the funding? All right. Thank you. Great show. Bye. I hope you could hear that okay. 
I did, and uh, it's a great question. So b- basically he's asking, um, since groups, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, that since these groups seem to have a lot of money and a lot of sort of media power and market power, how do we overcome their message? And, um, y- you know, what we have that they don't have, uh, and which is rare in other areas of animal protection in terms of majority, but we have a majority of the hearts and minds of uh, the people or citizens. Um, and all we need to do is to start letting our elected officials know that that the, sh- the local shelter, for example, um, is not run in a way that reflects our values. And, and I'll just give you one example. In Atlanta, Georgia, for many, many years, um, the local Humane Society contracted with Fulton County, Georgia, uh, to run animal control. And the head of that Humane Society was a darling of HSUS. He actually sat on their National Sheltering Committee. He helped influence policy as it relates to companion animals uh, for HSUS. But the shelter itself killed somewhere upwards of 80 to 90 percent of all the dogs that came through. And the citizens sort of finally said, enough is enough. And they began attending city council meetings and and started making the types of demands that we're seeing more and more in communities across the country. And what what they didn't have, which we now have, are successful jurisdictions. Nonetheless, uh, you know, that we can point to. So you're not alone when you walk up to the city council and say, we want to end the killing in our local shelter. You've got Tompkins County as an example. You've got Charlottesville, Virginia as an example, and some of the other communities that I talk about in the book uh, and that have gone no kill since the publication of the book uh, to point to and say, look, they're doing a better job than we're doing. They're spending no more money to do it. Uh, and we love dogs and cats here just as much as they do. Uh, and that type of argument is actually winning converts uh, among city councils nationwide. I mean, one of the things that I do now as the director of the No-Kill Advocacy Center is I actually go to communities nationwide to help municipalities, uh, you, you know, move from a kill, sort of adopt some kill the rest uh, sh- model of sheltering to a no kill model of sheltering. And I've gone, Bob, I've gone to places that I never thought I would visit. I've gone to rural Georgia. I've got, gone to rural Utah. I've gone to Philadelphia, Seattle, you know, places big and small, rural and urban, urban red and blue. And at the end of the day, I've seen how passionate uh, both both po- political parties and, and people of all walks of life that sit on these city councils are when it comes to dogs and cats. And I think that's what makes this an issue that is so ripe for victory and so important, not just in and of itself, but for the animal rights and animal welfare movements. Because for me, um, this issue is the bridge uh, that will lead to success in other areas of animal protection uh, because people have a very real and deep and personal relationship with their dogs and cats and they learn compassion and they learn that their animals think and feel and suffer uh, and it with the right information and the right message uh, we can extend that sympathy and that compassion to other species of animals but when groups like HSUS and PETA say that dogs and cats don't have rights and don't have a right to live and in fact can and should be killed in shelters, we, we sort of burn the bridge to these larger issues. And that's why I, I think they do a disservice not just to dogs and cats, but to all the animals they claim to represent. That's an excellent point. Um, when I when I teach any classes on kind of animal rights issues, I immediately go straight to people's companion animals because it gives me, uh, like you said, an immediate bridge right into the issue. And so I, I, com- I couldn't agree with you more. Also, I mean, in our experience, we um, one of the dogs that that we adopted, she's a black dog, and she was in a, a shelter for a year before she came to us, a no, no-kill shelter. And after we adopted her, some folks who we know kind of through the animal rights movement um, mentioned to us that no-kill shelters were kind of a myth and that all they really did was turn dogs and cats away, right? Is So what they were what they were essentially saying was, well, you know, look, you adopted this one dog, but think about all the dogs that were turned away by the shelter, that were probably turned away by the shelter. And the implication was is that we were kind of delusional in thinking that no-kill was even a possibility. We were delusional in, in, in supporting the shelter and in taking, I know, our little black dog out of that shelter. And so uh, I'm wondering if maybe you could address that that idea. I think it comes largely through a lot of these big movement organizations, but maybe you could address the idea that no-kill shelters are really just limited admission shelters. I mean, why is that a flawed idea? Well, well, first of all, I, I, I mean, even if that were true, um, y- you know, the argument being made is that 
snow-kill shelters are derelict because they refuse to kill animals. And so it's almost like the people are arguing that it's better that shelters take in animals and kill them than say we're not going to be in the killing business. And it's almost like saying to you know, a homeless shelter that deals with homeless people, let's say that can only afford to feed, you know, provide food for 1,000 homeless people a day, uh, and it has to turn away 500 at the end of the day. It's almost like saying, you know, why aren't you doing more? I mean, if a, if a shelter can't do more humanely by not killing, it's not obligated to, to do more. And, and as at least it relates to your little dog, um, the fact that this shelter made a commitment to keep this dog alive is important for the life of that dog. And then you now have a dog that would have otherwise been killed at a traditional shelter. But at the end of the day, it's not even true because what I argue in the book uh, is is that you know you know while we want no kill shelters, our goal is our no kill communities, meaning uh, where all none of the shelters in the community kill savable animals, and 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 that actually has been achieved because for example in Tompkins the Tompkins County New York the animal control shelter there actually is mandated to take in all animals as a open admission facility and it's saving and has since 2002 saved somewhere between 92 and 93 percent of all the animals now at the end of the day unfortunately there are going to be some animals and I would argue that it's less than seven percent who are truly hopelessly ill or injured uh, and for whom you know keeping them alive Life might even be cruel, and unfortunately, there at this point in time in history, there's always going to be some dogs, and I would argue it's less than five percent uh, who are truly vicious with a poor prognosis, and adopting them would be dangerous. But for the 93 plus percent of all the dogs and cats entering that shelter since 2002, um, they have been guaranteed a, a loving new home, and that's true now in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the open admission animal control shelter is saving year to date. 94% of all dogs and cats coming through its facility. And it's also true in other animal control shelters. So a no-kill shelter right at this point in history is more likely to be limited admission than not. But there are no-kill communities and no-kill shelters that are both private and public, that are limited admission and open admission. Uh, and if uh, uh, all shelters implemented, as I said, comprehensively, the programs and services of the no-kill equation, then they too can achieve success regardless of whether they're open admission or not. And I think where that came from, Bob, is really the uh, backlash from traditional shelters and from these large national groups that uh, that uh, wanted to defray criticism for killing, and I would argue they do that by painting the alternative as darker. Mm-hmm. Well, since you mentioned um, the Tompkins County example there, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience there as executive director of the SBCA, <coughs> about maybe a little bit about what you were hired to do and how you made some of the changes you made? Well, it, 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 the story actually starts in San Francisco. Um, we were at the point where we were say we were at the time the most successful community in the country at saving lives. We were saving lives at about three times the rate of most urban communities uh, and well above the national average. And uh, we had been saving every healthy dog and cat citywide. Um, since 1994. Unfortunately, new leadership at the agency, my boss, left and a new director was brought in. I was the director of operations, but the the, the president above me, who, who actually ran the organization, had different priorities and started moving away from the nuts and bolts programs that had made the city so successful. I I mean, it was tragic, but it was also deliberate. Uh, And so I started to look for another community to sort of expand the model. And one of the things, criticisms that I heard from communities nationwide was, okay, well, maybe you can create success in San Francisco, which they called a, a, a progressive, intelligent urban community. You, but you could not achieve that success in a more rural community because of what they claimed was poverty and more antiquated views of animals. And so when the Tompkins County job opened up in what I call a uh, rural-slash-semi-urban community in upstate New York, I took it 
because I wanted to prove that the, uh, that the concepts of whether a shelter was limited admission, open admission, urban, rural, didn't matter, that the only thing that mattered was whether the shelter had sort of embraced this culture of life-saving and followed through with the programs and services that made it possible. And so when I got to Tompkins County, um, you, you know, I inherited a shelter that was geared to overkill just like any other. I inherited a shelter uh, that I thought had very uh, poor care of the animals, which is not uncommon, and a staff that never once saw the killing as its own fault. It, it sort of adopted this convenient excuse that the fault belonged to the public and that they were merely doing the public's dirty work. Uh, but, I, you know, I, one, didn't drive 3,000 miles and move my family to kill animals, and so I took killing off the table, having brought with me the lessons I learned from the then most successful community in the country. And what I found was rather than the stereotypes of a community that uh, didn't care about their animals, every time I appealed to the community for help, the community responded overwhelmingly, and we reduced the death rate by 75% uh, very, very quickly, virtually overnight, never once killed a healthy animal and became no-kill uh, in, in 2002, six months after I got there, uh, and literally created the nation's first no-kill community. And, uh, and since then, and several other communities have followed the model, and, and what has what has been uh, really exciting for me, and what bodes well for the future is, no matter what excuse has been offered, it's been overcome. So after Tompkins, for example, was successful, the argument became you can do it in the north, but you can't do it in the south, in the southern U.S. US because of what they said was mean-spiritedly what they called the Bubba factor. Uh, and so we took the no-kill equation to Charlottesville, Virginia, a community in the south, and uh, created a no-kill community. And then the final argument, I mean, they're still arguing it's not possible, even though it's already been achieved, but then they claimed that uh, you can create it in those types of communities, but you can't create it in rapidly growing ones. So, for example, if a community is expanding, you know, seeing tremendous urbanization and urban sprawl and suburban sprawl, uh, there would be this mass influx of uh, new people and new animals, which would quickly overwhelm the infrastructure of animal control, forcing them to kill. So we took the model to Reno, Nevada, which is the fastest growing county in the country's fastest growing state, and they've cut the death rate in half and more than doubled adoptions, and they are now saving 92% of all the dogs and uh, over 80% of the cats, and that has happened overnight. That's amazing. Yeah. It's just simply, <laughs> it's incredible. And I, I don't know, I, it frustrates me so much to think that there are still shelters out there that are that are doing the same old thing over and over and over again, really out of the sense of inertia. I find it so frustrating. How, how do you well, not find it so incredibly frustrating? <laughs> Um, well, well, you're assuming I don't find it frustrating. <laughs> well, I mean, you and, do it for uh, your living, so I guess that, that helps. Right, but sometimes I feel like I just want to hit my head against the wall because <laughs> how many more examples of success do we need before finally people say enough is enough? And you know what it comes down to? And it's sad and it's unfortunate, but the, the reality is the reality. And that is just because an organization comes with the name Humane Society and just because an organization claims it's it's it's, uh, you know, all life is precious in its mission statement, doesn't necessarily mean that it's run by individuals who are passionate about saving lives. And, uh, and that's why I argue in the book that, you know, we've got shelter directors who are mired in these failed ways of doing business. And to achieve success nationwide, um, the first thing we need to do is to reclaim these organizations and fill them with people who might not know you know, going in, you know, what's, what's a parvicide or what the vaccination protocol should be. All that stuff can be learned. But what they need to have, which I have seen firsthand, uh, a lot of shelter directors don't, is a passion for saving lives. And, and so I always like to remind people that we don't know who the no-kill leaders of tomorrow will be. And I would argue that anybody with a deep and abiding love 
for animals and a can-do attitude should and can take over uh, leadership positions at these shelters, and they will achieve the kinds of success that were once dismissed as smoke and mirrors by leaders of the past. And, and what stops people from going into those positions is this idea, well, I can't kill animals. And my argument to them as an ethical vegan and an animal lover is you don't have to. You know, one of the things I really like about um, about your book is that it, it, around the end of the book, you start talking about how we need to have a movement where we aren't afraid to really vigorously debate issues. And I think that there's some suppression of that. And I, I think that's such a valuable insight in the book. Well, I, I absolutely agree. And, and we've argued to each other for, I think, too long that movement unity is a value that is sort of sacrosanct, that if we, if we fight amongst um, ourselves, then we can't fight our common enemies. And I would argue that that is the basis of stagnation, because if you look at, at sort of the more progressive elements of our movement, and I don't care whether it's companion animals or, or you know, animals that are killed for food or animals that are used for entertainment or, or, or animal research or, or what the animal exploitation going on is. Um, you know, there, it, it has been people uh, who are sort of beholden only to their conscience that have taken initially unpopular positions that have sort of made these tremendous gains that have moved us forward. And as, when we stop saying, this is wrong, uh, just because we want to go with the crowd that we identify with, then I think that we will have betrayed the very animals that, that sort of got us into this movement in the first place. And, and we owe no duty to any group, regardless of what they claim or their mission statement is. The only duty we owe is to doing what's right and to the animals who are dying uh, when we don't stand up for them. And, 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 uh, but, but if you do that, then the power groups, the groups that hold market power, the HSUSs, the PETAs, uh, then they label you divisive. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's, that's unfortunate but real and something we need to ignore uh, so that we can keep pushing the envelope of life-saving, not just for dogs and cats, but for all animals. In the book, you talk about this whole issue of temperament testing, and you kind of talk about pit bulls. And I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the flaws of temperament testing as it's currently practiced. Um, absolutely, but let me backtrack if I, I could for a moment and say, you know, in, in the book, uh, although I don't nearly give it its due, I do mention that, uh, you know, at this point in history, um, you know, there are some animals uh, that are too injured or too ill, truly suffering, uh, that are, are killed in shelters. And there are some dogs who are truly vicious, uh, whose adoption would be dangerous. I, I'm not saying that th their killing has no ethical issues surrounding it. I mean, I am hopeful because there's a growing movement of sanctuaries and hospice care groups that are sort of challenging that notion. And they're saying if an animal is ill, hopelessly ill, but, uh, you know, has, you know, one month or two months or three months uh, where, where that animal can have some quality of life, the, the same way we treat people who are dying. You know, someone's got, you know, advanced cancer with a poor prognosis and only has three months to live. We don't euthanize them. We, we let them live their lives and give them as much comfort and compassion and love as possible. And that movement is growing. And I think that movement is even going to challenge the no-kill paradigm, and I look forward to having that debate. And with vicious dogs, it's true that you, I can't advocate for their adoption, and responsible shelters don't. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, that they should be executed. I mean, they are now, and that's definitely tragic. But I'm hopeful in the future that sanctuary groups challenge that too and say, as a society, we have to find a place where they can be with other dogs and have quality of life, even if they are, they're not safe to put around people. Uh, having said that, um, right now, unfortunately, vicious dogs don't have an option other than killing in the vast majority of cases. Uh, and, but I take great lengths in the book to argue that we need to, uh, when we're going to claim a dog is vicious, we need to do everything in our power to make sure that, you know, how we get to that determination is comprehensive and rigorous and fair. And uh, the, the process that shelters use today is a process called temperament testing, which is where they put the dog through a series of exercises that the dog would experience outside 
inside the shelter and see if the dog responds viciously. Uh, and But unfortunately, the way it's currently done, the way it's being promoted by groups like HSUS is incredibly unfair to the dogs and results in too many dogs being killed who are not vicious at all. For example, um, I was watching, uh, I was at my veterinarian's office not too long ago because my, unfortunately my cat was at the end of his life um, and I was looking up, uh, you know, I was sitting in the waiting room and they had that show Animal Planet on TV and they showed this show called Houston Animal Cops and they took this dog, this beautiful dog uh, from an, a neglectful situation where the dog wasn't being fed properly and they took the dog into the shelter and they were prosecuting the woman and this dog was about 50 pounds underweight um, and what they did was temperament evaluated the dog. They, they put food in front of the dog and they tried to take the food away. And when the dog growled uh, because he didn't want the food away, they claimed he was vicious and they killed him. Um, that, to me, is adding the ultimate insult to a life of injury for that dog because that dog was not aggressive. That dog was hungry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That dog was 50 pounds underweight. And what a progressive and uh, shelter would have done was brought that dog up to weight uh, because that dog has not had a, a, you know, a, 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 you know, groceries or a meal on a daily basis for months, which was the basis for the cruelty case, and to show that dog food and then take that dog away when that dog is wired to think, I don't know when my next meal will come, uh, was a tragedy and a travesty. And that's what shelters are doing to claim dogs are vicious. And that way, they can tell the public, well, we're saving, quote, unquote, all adoptable animals, when in fact they're just mislabeling animals as unadoptables, animals that could be very loving uh, and are very safe and killing them. Um, And I'll tell you, in all my years of running shelters, I have never once killed a dog for growling around the food bowl. One, because we can always correct that behavior with one or two weeks of rehabilitation. Uh, And two, uh, because uh, rarely is what we are seeing true aggression. More often than not, what we are seeing is a skinny dog who is hungry, and all it takes often is bringing that dog up to weight. But that's what shelters are doing now, and and those are the types of things that I think uh, people who uh, care about this issue need to be vigilant, because there are too many shelters that are embracing the language of no kill, but not the philosophy, not the culture, and not the programs and services that save lives. So regardless if a shelter says we're no kill, at the end of the day, if they're not saving over 90% of all uh, impounded animals, then they're selling you a line. It seems that there's also this general need for education about dog behavior out there as well. Well, absolutely. And, you know, what we found in in progressive shelters, that's actually one of the programs of the No Kill Equation, and that is helping people overcome what they see are problems in their relationship with their animals, but more often than not not is either normal dog behavior that just needs to be channeled or or the person's ignorance. So, for example, you know, a a dog is barking, 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 and the person's ready to give up on the animal. There's actually only four reasons why dogs bark. And all you have to do is spend 20 minutes on the phone with someone as a shelter employee and actually walk them through the steps to determine what kind of barking it is. And all of them have a very quick and easy fix. And when you do that, we've done some surveys and found that as as much as 80% of the people who are going to surrender their animals with quote-unquote behavior problems end up keeping them if they're given good advice education and help in resolving some of those problems. But too many shelters, again, are are passive. They don't trust people. If someone calls and says, I want to surrender a dog, they instantly think they're a lousy human being and, and this dog is better off dead than with them, rather than ask the question, what's wrong and can we help you try to make it right? Excellent. Do you... Uh- do you have a few more minutes? I don't want to take sure. up too much time. Okay, as much good. time as you guys want. Excellent. Um, because we have a, uh, just a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, in the book, you talk about trap, neuter, release of feral cats. I was wondering if you could maybe dis- discuss that strategy a little bit and some of the opposition to it, both historically and presently. Well, you know, this sort of goes back to, uh, 
you know, the Stanford Cat Network experience where the university wanted to trap and kill these 1,500 feral cats living on campus and the Humane Society of Santa Clara Valley concurred with that decision and the Humane Society of the United States concurred with that decision. Um, you know, the, the concept of TNR or trap, neuter, return or trap, neuter, release is a program where these unsocialized alley cats, sometimes they're called bush kitties, sometimes they're called feral cats, um, they... Um, they are tra- humanely trapped. They're sterilized so that they don't reproduce. They're given a rabies vaccination in the vast majority of cases. And then they're re-released back to their habitats where they're watched and cared for uh, by volunteers. Um, and it's a program that has been successfully practiced in Europe for decades. And it really started catching on in the 1990s in the United States, the early 1990s, although it had been practiced uh, in the 19, uh, late 1980s, and there's at least one colony that goes back further than that. Um, but it's a program that is really revolutionizing sh- sheltering nationwide because that program is single-handedly responsible for the biggest declines in cat killing in shelters nationwide. In fact, there was a recent study in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association that did a survey of shelters, every shelter in Ohio, and found that the only shelters that were seeing declines in impounds and killing were those shelters that had TNR programs. And yet, uh, historically, um, the large national groups like HSUS attacked those programs and, in fact, said that because cats are domesticated animals, they belong in homes, and if they're unsocial, then they're better off dead. Um, and they made a whole series of arguments like they're suffering out there or, you know, they're killing birds and all these arguments. And they actually uh, said that uh, mass killing in shelters was the only practical and humane solution for the issue of feral cats. And, and again, you know, what, what kind of group that sets itself up as animal protection is out there denigrating and calling for the killing of cats? But that is the status quo in the companion animal movement in the United States. And, and more importantly, when you look at the arguments, they tend to be false. You know, this movement makes a lot of decisions, if I can use a pun here, based on unfounded dogma, uh, when if you actually look at the data and look at the facts and look at the studies, they usually come out on the side of the animals. There was an 11-year study of feral cats. It's the most comprehensive study of feral cats today, found that outdoor feral cats had an average lifespan of over 90% that of the house cat. So in other words, they have similar baselines for life expectancy. They have similar similar baselines for health. They have similar baseline for, for all these other issues. Uh, and, and so cats out there aren't suffering. And then when you look at the predation studies, they actually show that feral cats are actually very poor uh, uh, predators of birds, that they're not impacting bird populations the way groups like HSUS have said. What's killing the birds is human encroachment on their habitat. It's the use of pesticides and other poisons and is over-trapping. Um, But at the end of the day, you can never make the ethical argument that because some of these cats will suffer, potentially suffer at some time in the future, that they should be killed, that they should all be killed now. That's just inherently unethical, uh, even though it's an argument that HSUS and other groups have made for many years and some of the groups make uh, to this day. Man. After listening to all of this, um, I'm sure many of our listeners are probably wondering what they can do to sort of change this whole atmosphere of, you know, killing is the only solution that we have. Um, So what can they do if they want to move maybe their local shelters to no-kill? What can they do to get started? Well, on the No-Kill Advocacy Center's website at nokilladvocacycenter.org, we have a whole section called Reforming Animal Control. Um, we have a step-by-step guide uh, for, for people to change the animal control uh, shelter in their community. We have model legislation that if animal control won't change willingly, that they can seek to pass, which will force them to change legally. Um, we have... Uh, uh, the you know a discussion of the programs and services necessary, model jurisdictions that they can point to that are saving the lives uh, at the same or even less cost, and so there's uh, you know you know how to respond to the arguments. 
um, uh, how to wage a public relations campaign, all of it there. It doesn't cost anything. All they have to do is click and print and really uh, band together. And I think what they'll find is that they're not alone. When they start making the claims publicly, when they write the letters to the editor, when they write the city council or show up at city council meetings, they'll find that, that most of the people share those values. And so it's a question of getting together with like-minded individuals and really challenging the status quo. Because at the end of the day, you know, we are paying for the killing through our taxes and our philanthropy to these organizations. Uh, we are being blamed for the killing by because they blame the public. Uh, the killing is being done in our name as citizens, but we aren't paying the ultimate price. I mean, that is truly being paid by the animals who are unfortunate enough not to enter a shelter that has not embraced a, a culture of life-saving. Uh, and because we are not paying that ultimate price, it is incumbent upon us to give voice to those animals that don't have one. And when the shelter in our community doesn't reflect our values, we have to stand up and say enough is enough. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Nathan, I, uh, Nathan, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. It was extremely powerful, and I hope people will take it to heart and go out and make changes in their community so that we can actually begin to actually realize this this uh, this vision of a no-kill country. I also just want to add very quickly that if you want to learn more about Nathan, you can go to his website at nathanwenegrad.com. We'll put links to that in the show notes, also the nokilladvocacycenter.org. And where can people get your book? Um, the book is available through you know all the internet sales sites like Barnes & Noble, Borders, Amazon, and stuff. And it should also be available uh, through their local bookstore. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show, Nathan. We really appreciate your time and uh, your powerful message. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Okay, we're back. Yes, and thank you once again to Nathan for talking with us. Absolutely, and um, you can find out more about uh, about his organization and his book and all that on the interwebs, of course. Of course, you know, talking with him made me. Oh, it always thinks. I always think about my grandmother as an example, and I think I've talked about her on past shows. My grandmother volunteers at a no kill shelter. And this is in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Yes. It's a small town, rural, red state part of Pennsylvania. Um, and these people have gotten together and have gotten people to donate land to them. They go out to the mall all the time. They bring the animals with them. They are in the public. They do fundraisers. They are, you know, just a group of passionate people who don't want to see animals die. Absolutely. And, you know, and unfortunately, these people aren't like vegan or anything, but there is the passion that's there. And they just decided they're going to do this. They foster animals. You know, they're, they're putting together the shelter and they've decided no kill is the way they have to go. Absolutely. And they're doing a lot of the things that Nathan talks about in his book. Exactly. So it's very empowering to know that there are places around the U.S. that are doing this. Absolutely. And I, what I like about what, what Nathan says is that he wants to give you the tools to make these changes locally. Yes. And I think that is extremely powerful and important. Cool. Well, that's it for this week. We'll be back again next week with some Vegan Freak Radio at some point or another. Yes. 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 Definitely. Good. <laughs> I'm waiting for the dogs to be bad. Yeah, I know. They're they're under the table. They're sort of snipping at each other and I know. creating static. I and... just thought before <laughs> before I go into my next little piece, I wanted to make sure the dogs weren't going to interrupt the show. Okay, too much. there we go. Anyway, um, I want to ask, we want to ask that if you enjoy Vegan Freak Radio, a couple things. Uh, please think about telling a friend about Vegan Freak Radio. Think about signing up for our email announcement list. All we do is send you an email when the show comes out. And... Um, Positive reviews at the iTunes Music Store do help us greatly. We have a lot of uh, good reviews there, but a few more always help. So if you like the show, please go to the iTunes Music Store and say so. Yes, that would be very wonderful for us. And if you have any questions or comments, be in touch. You know our voicemail line is 267-295-1944. If you go to veganfreakradio.com, you can also leave a voicemail electronically using the little thing in the right-hand side of the screen, the MyChingo thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you can send us an email at show at veganfreakradio.com. Uh, I think that's about all. Yep. Cool. I think you got it. All right. Well, thank you for listening and stay in touch with us. We'll be back again soon. Bye. Bye.